can you name a single profession that's been completely taken over by ai even though we've been here for 18 months the answer is no can i name a single company which says oh i don't need to hire a person for that i can use ai nobody has said that let me use ai to make my teams more productive instead of replacing them that replacement aspect we are still far from i know that crypto and blockchain was quite big we had a big cycle and everything fell flat on their faces bull and bear markets come every 24 months roughly i have seen four bear markets now i'm pretty confident when i say that i don't think crypto is ever gonna die now what's your thesis on where blockchain is right now i'm very excited about the potential technologies that can be built out people just conflate the two and they're like oh blockchain has been around for like 15 years why haven't you guys had your chat gpt moment we are trying to solve for real problems in the world and until unless we have infrastructure that supports the solution for those real problems a token price going up cannot be a business model it needs to have something more substantial it needs to have value being accrued over a period of time would you invest in something which is pre-product or just a team what needs to be there as a minimum don't come to us with a half-baked idea right don't be like oh i want to build something in fintech have some sort of a unique insight have some sort of a wedge preferably have relevant background help us understand your vision and your unique insight better so that then we can take it forward and help you visualize it in a more macro manner hi everyone my name is ash arora i'm a partner at local globe you're listening to innovation civilization podcast this is the innovation civilization podcast and my name is wahid today we have ash arora from local globe who's a partner leading their web3 practice local globe is one of the most fascinating venture capital firms based out of the uk that i came across they are ranked number one early stage fund doing pre-seed and seed in european union emea and number three globally with the highest number of unicorns in their portfolio that's companies and startups which are worth at a billion dollars a lot of unicorn companies that you might come across are household names actually like robin hood wise figma twitter all of which local globe was an early investor in so enjoy the show and let's get right to it brilliant ash aurora welcome to the innovation civilization podcast what a great pleasure to have you here today thank you so much wahid i'm really excited to be here today Brilliant, brilliant. All right, let's get right to it then, Ash. Um, can you tell us a bit more about uh, yourself and what you're doing at Local Globe? Yeah, um, so I'm Ash for all your audiences. I am the youngest partner at Local Globe. Um, here I lead our blockchain investments. So we have uh, a pre seed and seed fund called Local Globe. We also have um, sort of growth and late stage funds called Latitude and Solar, respectively. Um, and then we have an LP fund called Basecamp. So across all four funds, I lead our blockchain practice. We do mm. um, sort of we are very sector agnostic within blockchain, um, and we have a fairly huge geographical mandate as well. Um, we mm. are very active blockchain investors for quite a while now. We've done the seed for Sorare, Copper, and Improbable, all three unicorns mm. in the last few years. Um, and another right. 10 or so blockchain investments. One of them just got acquired yesterday, actually, by another unicorn oh. startup in the US. So that was great news Incredible. for us. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a fun journey. We have some, thank you so much. We have some yeah, big yeah. companies we are working with. I closed my last blockchain deal two weeks ago, which has not been announced mm. yet, but soon. So yeah, mm. having fun, um, doing a lot. And prior to this, I was, you know, um, doing blockchain anyway. So it just comes naturally to me. Um, apart from blockchain, I'm mm. also um, helping run our AI investment. So it's funny, this week, mm. I'm looking at two AI companies and sort of I'm knee deep with diligence. So um, right. I'll keep the dark circles for that. But um, <laughs> yeah, so AI has also become like a recent um, sort of, um, it, you know, uh, era that I'm spending a lot of time in in the last year. year yeah, now. yeah, that's incredible, and um, it's great to see. By the way, like we were just talking about this before we started the recording, that deals are back, right? So companies are getting funded, basically, and the kind of flow of money is is basically out there in the market. I know that. Um, I think Local Globe actually. I was just checking before this. You know, uh, it's got one of the highest unicorn hit rates uh in terms of a european fund um right um i think just for the audience i think there's more than 58 sort of exits or 60 now um and even like sort of household names like transferwise revolut figma monzo zoopla city mapper uh robin hood all these are i think 
your portfolio companies, right? Which is uh, which is super amazing. So um, if I if I can um, ask uh, Ash, so what do you think? So you mentioned about blockchain investments, and now you're looking at AI and the incredible track record you guys have at you know kind of building these companies and getting them to exit and uh, helping sort of grow the economies. So what's your like investment criteria like what do you guys do differently than some of the other funds out there you know i think that's a very good question it's a question that i get to answer very rarely um i would say i think so every fund has their own unique set of skills they have their own unique offering i think just the way in which we go about explicitly sharing the offering that we have yeah. is um to me was very unique right so i can talk mm-hmm. about i'm the i'm the youngest person on the investments team when i say youngest i don't just mean by age but also by the duration yeah. of time i've spent with the team um so i'm almost like a you know like a third party set of eyes that have come into the into the fund and having looked at the fund from outside mm-hmm. well enough um, so I had created this right, prior right. to joining. I had created this like 52 parameter framework, which um, I uploaded and mm-hmm. by the way, publicly shared on LinkedIn as well since then. Uh, but I spent like three oh, months right, building right. out this framework. Oh, show notes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll send across nice. the video. Okay. Um, a lot of people actually told me they found it very useful, but um, I created okay. it just for myself to understand how do I go about evaluating the fund I work for? Because I, right, I'm right. You know, like in our 20s, especially being a Gen Z, I think all of us are just looking for any stint for like a year or two that gets us to a mm-hmm. certain level of pay or a certain level of experience or exposure mm-hmm. or brand. Yeah. So that after that, we can yeah. then switch. I think that kind of agility, which is good as well as mm-hmm. bad, the bad comes from because we are mm-hmm. not able to capitalize on the compounding that happens when you stay yeah. in one place for long enough. The good is because then Correct, you don't yeah. let a company price your ability, you let the market price your ability. So that's a good side. So I created this framework thinking all of these different, you know, factors in mind, I put on my economist hat on. um, And Mm. yeah, I ranked all the sort of funds I was talking to. And of course, I'm not going to mention the funds, but like I had Mm -hmm. six other funds that I was speaking with and close to joining. And LG was the seventh and I ended up joining Local Globe. Um, I see. Simply because across the framework, Local Globe ranked the highest. So now, I think the way I would articulate as what is unique about us is a lot of the stuff in that framework. So stuff like, mm. you know, how many previous unicorn founders became LPs in the current fund, right? Uh, it tells you so Dr- much skin about, in the game. Yeah. Exactly. It tells you so much yeah. about how value additive we really were with founders, mm. right? Because on LinkedIn, on social media, every founder is gonna say nice nice things about their VCs. It's like the backroom mm. gossip or like private members clubs where these sort of successful founders, they say good mm. or bad things about specific people that they worked with, yeah. right? So it becomes very important to gauge that and how do I gauge that when I don't know the founders myself? Mm. So like, I just asked this question outright that how many of your previous unicorn founders ended up doing small LP checks into your latest fund? Mm. And how yeah. many of them did you take? So the, yeah. just as an example, I mean, there are 51 other things in the framework as well. So we can link up exactly. But like, just, yeah, just it, for our audience, basically, it's um, LPs are limited oh, partners right. and these folks who actually are investors within the fund, right? And exactly. GPs are the people who are deploying the fund and looking after the day to day. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So that's quite interesting. So you mentioned that. Um, so what what else? Uh, what else did you look at? That's, that's quite interesting, by the way, uh, like a due diligence of the fund itself. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, I looked at the standard stuff as well. So like there there are financial metrics I can kind of talk yeah. about as well. So like TVPI yeah. is one metric um, yeah. that is used to evaluate funds that stands for yeah. total value divided by paid and capital, which yeah. is basically if somebody says they have a unicorn in their portfolio. So the valuation of that unicorn divided by the mm. valuation that they entered the company at gives mm. you the TVPI number. Yeah. Um, and then similarly to that, DPI becomes distributed by paid and capital, which is basically yeah. the amount of capital you return to your LPs, yeah, which basically yeah, yeah. means that paper valuation has transcribed itself into actual liquid liquid um, number, yeah. like a dollar or like a pound yeah. amount. Um, and now yeah. you can basically repay your LPs. So generally, DPI tends mm. to be lower than DVPI. That's just the history yeah, of yeah. the last 20, 30 years on average. 
Yeah. Um, and it's exceptionally important that you have a consistent rate of high performing, above average performing DPI. Mm. So now DPI I mean, takes into account so many factors. It's also macroeconomic, right? I mean, a company mm. are public, like publicly listing themselves in a specific year, maybe all of them underperform because of what the macro interest rate phenomena looks like, yeah, so on yeah. and so forth. So mm. relatively speaking, I wanted a consistent like Kager of yeah. the compounded annual growth of yeah. the DPIs that, that were being calculated across different funds yeah. for like at least three or four consistent funds. And I just out of curiosity, like, um, of you know, in where did you get this data from? Because I know it's I very opaque. Oh, I right. Oh, you asked them. I mean, so they, it's not pitch I was interviewing with them. Yeah, it was like, you know, uh, at the end of an interview process, I tell everybody, ask me questions. If yeah. I meet a founder, if I'm interviewing a candidate, somebody who says, no, I don't have any questions to me, that tells see, me they are not interested in joining me. They mm -hmm. don't want to know anything about me. They are interested in the money, which means that if I'm giving them X amount, if somebody yeah. else gives them X plus 20%, they would leave me within a year. So like they are not here for anything beyond money if they are not trying to learn about me. So yeah. I, yeah, like when I released the framework, so many comments, there are so many funny comments on that post and they all said, yeah. you ended up diligencing the diligent. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Which is important, yeah. right? Yeah, Which is yeah. so important. It's, I think yeah. it's extremely important. So yeah, and I think the third thing that stood out for me um, another thing that I'd really like to mention yeah. is um, the Phoenix Court work. So our, all four mm. funds are under Phoenix Court Group. That's our parent company name. Sure. Um, and we have something known as Phoenix Court Works, where all partners and GPs do donate 2% of their carry mm. um, to this one foundation corpus, which okay. we use to kind of support the small businesses and initiatives in our um, physical geographical area where our office is. Mm -hmm. So we have helped create um, like a like a nursery mm -hmm. right next to our offices, right? Right between mm -hmm. British Library and the Crick Institute and King's Cross in London. Mm -hmm. We have also helped build like a school near us. We've also helped do like a bunch right. of other things. We continuously support businesses. For internal events, the catering comes from like that area and all I of see. that so area is like council housing and exactly I so see. like we find ways to support them um mm -hmm. and then we also work with like a large number of charities we have like a special team that only mm -hmm. does great export works yeah so we support um that entire team as well as lots of charities a bunch of us sit on the yeah. sit as trustees on the boards of these charities yeah. as well help them yeah. with fundraising and just That's, support our time yeah. and money basically yeah, that's incredible. Told me actually. a lot about the DNA yeah. of the of the fund, you know, and of the team, how they are thinking about the world around them. That's quite interesting. And in terms of after you put in a check with a with a, with a founder, do you guys help them in certain ways, like uh, just connecting them to folks or giving them tactical advice on how to run their business? Like, how hands on are you guys, and and like what sort of support do you guys give? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great question as well. I think. Um, it's one of those things where it's important to ensure that you are available and you yeah. are helpful, but it's yeah, also yeah. very important to ensure that you don't micromanage. I see. And you don't yeah. impose your vision on their vision. Correct, so yeah. it's the way I like to kind of articulate this to founders is that your VC is um, somebody like it's an mm. employee you can't fire. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So first of all, they're an employee. Think of it mm. from that lens. Um, secondly, we are basically here to add value to the business and help you mm -hmm. grow the business. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, we are there on the cap table in a significant manner. Mm -hmm. So it's important to ensure that you go for the right fit. So ensure mm -hmm. you ask questions, you interview us as well. You try to understand what we are thinking here should mm -hmm. be in line with what you are also like sort of visualizing. Mm -hmm. So I think the way we go about it is we help with, we have like a team internally that helps with talent. Mm -hmm. Like we help with hiring, mm -hmm. um, exceptional background of this, of, um, you know, the person who leads that. Then same goes for like portfolio support. So like somebody who needs like office space or operational access or like mm -hmm. intros to specific people in our portfolio, et cetera. We have a team for that that and mm -hmm. then we have a team for um sort of you know legals as well like we have an internal legal team but somebody in the team also can help with legal support yeah. in case you have to like i don't know sign ndas or yeah. 
um sort of you know like send an employment agreement to somebody mm. or something of that sort in the very initial days when you don't have enough capital or network to actually have your own law firm mm. um we can help out with stuff like that very basic stuff but then yeah. eventually we get to a point where we help with go to market we help with mm. the right angel investors we help with follow on mm. investor introductions we help with how the mm. market is thinking evaluating and reviewing mm. the space yeah. the idea behind it is let's tell you everything that you don't know that we know simply by virtue of the fact that we see so many companies in this one sector mm-hmm. so we know the best practices we know the goods and the bads we know what kpis to optimize for what minimum level of a kpi you need to achieve for what exact milestone you're trying to go for stuff mm-hmm. like that which is something that maybe the business can automatically achieve without us informing them as well but yeah. it just helps gives the right direction as well yeah. as opens the right doors which could take like months to reach out mm-hmm. to otherwise yeah, so yeah. I think overall i think that's the best way to actually be an investor because the more we do then the more we'll have to compromise the vision of the founder as well which is something we don't like to do yeah 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 i think um previously i heard this before and i found it quite a good analogy that sometimes the investor needs to be like a shoulder to cry on sometimes it needs to be the person who just tells you what to do you know um sometimes it needs to be you know more hands on more hands off so it really sort of depends on you know what you need right and and, and the situations yeah. that arise um it's a balance yeah. it's an art yeah and, and, like, exactly. there are some gps yeah. in my team yeah. that do it phenomenally well like phenomenally yeah. well yeah yeah and a great avenue to learn from right uh, yeah. and just to clarify ash so are you doing like pre seed seed series a like where do you play So we do pre-seed and seed from local globe that is where we okay. like to lead that's our DNA of the fund for the last 24 25 years. Okay. Um and then we have a growth stage fund where we do series B to D. We don't like to lead. We do like a follow on kind of a check but a significant follow on check. So it's okay. not going to be like a 250k 500k check. Um it'll yeah. be like in millions but it would be the second or the third largest check. Oh, and then we do same check size but at a pre IPO stage which becomes a small at that stage but that is helping yeah. gear up the company to get ready to be publicly listed yeah okay that makes sense and i know that you know i mean we obviously had like a bit of a uh, tech winter recently you know last year or the last one and a half years before that it was all like super momentum investing and even pre product you know you get like crazy valuations and stuff like that so when you're looking at things right now um for example say pre seed uh like is it would you invest in something which is pre product or just a team like yeah what how what what needs to be there as a minimum basically you know right now in the current current conditions honestly conditions? um yeah. and i i don't know maybe this would <laughs> result in like a lot of conversation in the comment section yeah. but um i don't think as a fund we have a prerequisite for anything okay um, even if you have an idea walk mm. into the office schedule time with us and pitch ah. Right? interesting like yeah. basically at a stage where you are somebody who has enough knowledge i think the idea mm. should be don't come to us with like a half baked idea right don't mm. be like oh i want to build something in you know fintech yeah. have some sort of a unique insight have some sort mm. of a wedge um preferably have relevant background so that we know mm. what you're talking about is actually relevant yeah. and track um, record you know just yeah. track record exactly like yeah. basically just have some sort of an understanding but even if you don't have a deck It's yeah. fine. right mm. um work on it if you have a tiny demo give us that if you have a two page or give us that just help us understand your vision and your unique insight better so mm-hmm. that then we can kind of take it forward and help you visualize it in a more macro manner and mm-hmm. fund you with like small capital initially and then we can sort of take it forward but yeah pre seed seed um honestly like you know i'm even i used to angel as well so i still get a lot of angel mm. opportunities right. um, so all the angel deal flow i get i still sometimes use some of that to talk to from a local club lens mm-hmm. um simply because i feel that it's relevant for the fund yeah um and i feel that from a from like the fund's platform we can add value okay that's incredible actually good to know and um i just want to kind of fast forward to the market conditions right now and what you're seeing so i think i was listening to josh wolf um who's at lux uh, yeah. capital who talk yeah. about how he thinks that the current sort of conditions is akin to the dot com uh, bust basically where 2/3 of the venture capital funds just went to zero you know yeah. so um and i i have been you know sort of 
talk to friends and, and folks, you know, out there and they have been telling me that, yeah, lots of VCs, you know, and, and angels as well, they put so much money in crazy valuations and those companies went nowhere. Uh, and we had like, pretty much like a tech winter, lots of layoffs. I mean, even Tesla still laid off like, like I think, yeah. uh, last week, right? Like almost 10%. So what do you think of the market conditions right now? Basically, is it sort of picking up or yeah, where, where are we according to what you're seeing? That's a, that's a great question. I think um, sort of tech layoffs run with a little bit of inertia in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. They would run, they would happen like a few months after the market and the business and the product has already reached a stage where it needs to kind of start sort yeah. of picking up pace, reducing cash burn and sort of, you know, improving profitability, if not profits. Um, so I think we, um, you know, at early stage specifically, market mm -hmm. never really kind of disappears. It doesn't. Mm -hmm like freeze it's not frozen in time that mm -hmm. happens mostly at growth stage like after series a like mostly yeah. from series b those guys have been hiding a hard time yeah <laughs> exactly yeah so like yeah. series b plus becomes very yeah. hard because it's it's basic logic right like how how do you determine a company is ready for series b like if i give you two examples one company mm -hmm. is making 10 million arr is four years old um, and has basically shown you like two to three X year on year versus mm -hmm. another company, which is 15 years old, is now making 12 million ARR or 13 million ARR, has a lower burn than the first company. Which mm -hmm. one would you go for in the same sector? The reason mm -hmm. you would go for the first one is just growth. Yeah. It's growth in a shorter period of time. Even if it is lower numbers, they have mm. achieved more in a shorter period of time with a smaller team than mm. the second one. It's just basic logic. Yeah. So that's why growth stage pauses because you don't have that kind of like, you know, exponentially high growth mm. that happens when the markets are slower. So even if there are businesses, that's what I keep telling people, just because you're not able to fundraise doesn't mean you don't qualify as a business that is potentially mm. ready for Series B. That's mm. because give it another year, Try to grow, maybe like you grew, you know, 3x in 22, you grew 1x in 23, and let's say you grow 0.75x in mm -hmm. half of this year, or like whatever, most of this year. By mm -hmm. the end of this year, you have basically compounded, grown more than 4x in the last three years. Mm -hmm. When the macro market is right, you would be seen as growing 4 plus x, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to like, a business that grew less than 1x in the last 12 months. So yeah. it's just the way you look at a company, which is very important, mm -hmm. which is why growth stage really pauses during a tech winter. And of course, late stage mm -hmm. is like a byproduct of growth stage. So that pauses even further for a longer period of time as well. But mm -hmm. early stage doesn't because innovative, talented, innovative builders have ideas all the time. It's They are right. not linking that to market, right? They are not like, oh, interest rate is lower, blah, blah, blah. It's hard to IPO, mm -hmm. but I won't start this one business because I had this unique idea about blockchain. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. that rationale doesn't exist. So early stage is still very, very active in general. Um, I do feel that what this does is, um, you know, layoffs end up making a people prioritize their financial health a lot more. So mm -hmm. they slightly become risk averse. So what happens is that early yeah. stage acquiring talent becomes um, sometimes easier, sometimes harder. Mm -hmm. In the last one year, in my opinion, it, it was easier because the layoffs were like massive. Mm. Um, and there was a really a large amount of talent pool available talent in the market. There. Exactly. Mm. That was like smart people. Um, yeah. Exactly. Over optimizing for immediate financial support. Right. Mm. Which is great because they would have taken like a 20, 30 percent pay cut and joined like a startup, but then with equity preferably yeah. hopefully um and now that you know the markets are going to come back and when that equity performs well they would say hey that was the best decision of my life mm -hmm. um so i think that was actually a good thing that came out of the last 12 months the mm -hmm. bad thing was the startups themselves were not able to pay high enough salaries mm -hmm. to meet the sort of you know the level that all of this talent actually deserved in my opinion mm -hmm. Um, only because there was not enough growth stage funding uh, available, only because the macro markets were not supportive. So I think it's just like this flywheel yeah. that starts and yeah. then escaping that is only to kind of expand that flywheel by yeah. focusing more on building, getting profitability. The better margins you get today, mm. you might mm. not see impact for a year, but once you see that impact, your valuation is going to go 10x. Yeah, yeah. So, so are, are you seeing, uh, do you think we've kind of bottomed out right now uh, and or do you think we're still... Uh, there's still a bottom left to go. You know? I actually think we bottomed out like a few months ago. I think ah, okay. we have been cool. on recovery since then. I think Tesla is an exception here. Yeah. Um, mostly, again, because of, in my opinion, Tesla is actually an exception because of manufacturing supply chain as well as regulatory right. environments, mm -hmm. more so than tech. 
if you look at you know sort of S&P yeah. 500 for example all the tech mm. stocks are outperforming all the other sectors yeah. um and i don't even remember the number anymore but like tech stocks like the top 7 tech stocks are driving S&P 500 pretty, pretty much right? yeah. yeah yeah it's um, more it's like, like S&P 7 yeah. yeah something like that yeah yeah so yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to kind of see that. Um so that's why I feel that we bottomed out last year. Um and that's why both from like a public equities as well as crypto markets everything picked up in the last 6 months. Mm-hmm. I am hopeful that we have not picked up completely and we are yet to grow further. Mm-hmm. But this is the right kind of time. I feel that today as well as plus 3 to 6 months is the right time to start building. Mm-hmm. or um sort of show that level of profitability you know increase up your sales increase up your bd outperform mm-hmm. other competitors and players in your specific sector and market and win the market long enough to kind of raise that kind of growth round that you need or yeah. even consider publicly listing your company in the next 12 months Yeah 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 and and the thing is that growth is easier said than done especially if you're in that like series A kind of range right uh specifically I was you know seeing like B2B you know like no one no company is buying SaaS B2B SaaS seats anymore right uh it's just so hard like everyone's all the big in- industries and companies are like thinking of rationalizing number of you know SaaS software like do we really need 58 subscriptions of B2B SaaS can we not do with like 15 or 12 right and i've been a part of a lot of these conversations you know and a lot of the firms and so it just seems a bit different compared to yeah previous times where you are right that it it's meant that we're a bit more disciplined in terms of our pnl i guess right um so that's that's all sort of um helpful um in that direction i i completely agree i think um, one of the things for me b2b saas um, yeah. just take a step back maybe ask your don't ask yeah. your mom don't ask your friends they're all your echo chamber of support right yeah ask somebody who you've hated everyone hates somebody ask okay. someone who you've hated for a while but you respect their intellectual capability hmm. ask them whether you whether they think your product is a good to have or a need to have because honestly i think in b2b saas this could be a contrarian opinion i think a large number of products are good to have they are not need hmm. to have so hmm. i think trying to kind of dig deeper and getting that one unique insight if you already have a product that is making money that means you already have access you have distribution yeah. if you have that go deeper try to understand what exactly is another still problem that is pervasive across the organization yeah. um and try to kind of embed that into your product as an offering and i've yeah. seen a bunch of companies do this as well right like honestly i think snowflake has done this beautifully even mm-hmm. though it's a publicity company in the last few years they have done this very well salesforce mm-hmm. has done this very well if i talk about public companies even for private companies i mean i can't name most of them but like a bunch of them have done stuff like this where they have pivoted away they have sometimes even cannibalized their own business mm-hmm. right right like i tell everybody to read um um blitz scaling because what happened in china in the late 2000s is something early early 2000s is something that all of us need to understand better Yeah yeah yeah. I think um a helpful um sort of uh, kind of logical framework I kind of think about when I think about what we say need to have versus um should have um is is basically I think something like products can be put into um vitamins, aspirins and candies, right? Oh, I love so, that. Yeah yes. yeah. That's so, exactly so, what it yeah. is. Yeah, exactly what it is. So it's like uh, make sure you only invest and build aspirins, right? So aspirin uh if you go out and you've got a headache, you just need it, right? You just can't live without it. Uh whereas for vitamins, yeah, it's great like you know, it's super long term might be useful exactly. and candies like it's just sugar sugar rush. You don't really yeah. need it at all, right? Exactly. But if you're if you're uh, building something, yeah. build green leafy vegetables because that is a <laughs> So let's yeah. let's stick to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually a very good point, you know. Um yeah it's like a super drug you know green green leafy vegetables along with a bit of that's aspirin right yes that's what <laughs> that's now isn't it green leafy vegetables <laughs> it is it is brilliant um so i want to move a bit towards where the hype is right now and you know the two word that i'm going to say is basically ai you know um so there is just tremendous amounts of hype obviously since the llms kind of launched you know like 18 months ago now i believe so At local globe, how are you guys looking at the AI investment landscape? Like like how are you guys sort of where are you guys playing? Is it in the foundational model level or is the application level or hardware? Like how, how are you sort of, you know, thinking about all this in terms of AI investments? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. So AI um you know, 
by the way, it's so funny. Um, yeah. In my slang and lingo, AI for a very long time stood for not artificial intelligence, but for authentically Indian. Oh, right. Okay. It's so funny. Like me and my group of friends from yes. like high school have a group yeah. called AI. Because uh, we used to call ourselves authentically Indian. And somebody recently, I was just texting on that group and they're like, oh, wow, you have an AI group with like Indians. I'm like, no. This is like <laughs> high school friends. I see. Um, I see, I see. So it's so funny, the hype, right? Um, anyway, yeah. so 18 months, um, I think, in every single VC has done what? they've Everyone has done a bunch of market maps. We've yeah. done a lot of fundamental thesis building, white space analysis. Mm -hmm. We have spoken to like probably hundreds and hundreds of AI founders and startups. We have created and laughed at or been the victim of memes. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, we've done it all, right? Like 18 months, yeah, yeah. I've literally seen everything. Yeah. Um, I think the sort of a few things that we are doing internally um, and maybe you can actually educate me on what everyone else seems mm. um, is we of course have built market maps they have been refreshed every couple of months so we have mm. kind of reached a point where we are assuming that every market map is not sacrosanct and every yeah. week something new is happening which is why it's difficult to predict it's anymore crazy fast innovation, exactly. it's so fast right? innovation right it's like it's exactly crazy. the way blockchain was back in the day as well like it, mm -hmm. i remember during the bull cycle last bull cycle of blockchain it was exactly mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. so it's hard at this point to be building these kind of maps mm -hmm. um so that is one the second is from a thesis perspective we are all across we are doing all the way from like even you started at foundation i'll go step below that i'll talk about semiconductors uh, we're looking yeah. at semiconductors oh, really, yeah. about mm. chips exactly right like we're talking about like distributed decentralized computer talking mm. about h100 chips and like gpus etc everything and like mm. how to improve the competency how do you see underutilized like so on mm. and so forth there are so many different things that are happening in this space then mm. you have llms then you have middleware then you have ai tooling then you have like b2b or b2c or consumer sort of vertical ai kind of integrations you have pretty much the entire stack so we are all across. Prior to GPD coming out, we had 48 AI investments. So we were very actually bullish on Super AI. Active. Okay. Like quite a while since 2015, I think was our first AI investment. Yeah. But was it like Gen AI based ones or just like so It depends ML. actually. It was yeah. all across. It was yeah. ML data analytics, but there were a couple sure. of NLP investments as well. So that kind of right, became right. the bedrock for Gen AI eventually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think um, sort of GAI was definitely like a thematic area that we were exploring yeah. um, for quite some time. Mm. Um, AGI, however, is something that's kind of new, right? It's evolving mm. and we've still not reached that point yet, but um, it's something that has still become like a curiosity area for a bunch mm. of us. Um, and then apart from that, in the last 18 months, I'd say we've done like maybe eight eight ish eight mm. to ten i don't think more than ten i don't think below seven we've done yeah. it in ai um and those are kind of companies that are either in line with some of the thesis work that we had done back in the day like we kind of mm. had heavy conviction on hey this would work mm. um or it's been sort of evolutionary that every couple of months when we are refreshing the sort of the mm. market map and we are researching at that point we come across a company that's just like an automatic good fit Mm -hmm. or um, sort of what we are building or it's just from our network we know somebody exceptionally talented has a great idea at a pre-seed we would back them mm -hmm. um, just because we believe in their understanding their experience in that specific market so it's just been yeah. very varied in terms of that so it's both thesis driven as well as opportunistic driven yeah. um, but it's hard to kind of say that okay we'll just stick to like vertical you know consumer AI. It's just yeah it's too soon yeah to yeah yeah, too soon, right? And and you just don't know how the chips would fall in like five years time, 10 years time, you know, when it's time to exit uh, some of these companies and stuff yeah. like that. But I am getting the feeling more and more just talking to folks that there is a feeling within the foundational model layer that it's all going to be a handful of big companies and a race to the bottom, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, what these are, because you have open source as well, you know, and, and stuff like Hugging Face and stuff like that, which is, you know, doing so much stuff, right? Yeah. And it, it feels like, yeah, it's just, just going to be like hard to win uh, in that space specifically, where there might be a wedge is like, if you take those foundational yeah. models and train it with super proprietary data for like a specific use case, right? Mm -hmm. And then have some kind of killer application or, or, or whatever, you know, on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's where it's quite interesting Thing, you know and um, lots of experiments being done right now i guess you know we'll see where, where the chips fall basically right yeah, yeah no absolutely and it's funny you mentioned hugging face it's yeah. actually a team and a company we saw at uh, yeah. seed 
<laughs> right, okay. um, in 2017, we spent like a month diligencing them and spent a lot yeah. of time with them. We eventually did not get there on the on the product because the product was very different at that time. They were building like a mm. chatbot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it, it's so funny, like when Hugging Face became so big and I had joined LG and I was just going through like all the companies in our portfolio that we had gone through with AI. Mm. Um, and I came across Hugging Face. It's all <laughs> hugging face yeah. um, and like Clem and like his email back and forth. Like I literally saw everything and it, it was just so funny. So I think, like I said, we are very heavy conviction kind of investors. And of course, mm. that's a miss. But like, given what we knew at that time, if we yeah. knew that much today as well, we would take the same decision. So I think that speaks volumes. Yeah. And, the way and, we and, it's just, I wish we had seen yeah. them a little later or they had pivoted earlier. So we would 100% back them because we truly believe Clem is like an exceptional founder. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's quite incredible how these things change, right? So I was listening to Sam Altman in 2018, I think, speaking at Stanford, where he was like, oh, yeah, what we're doing is just like a research project. There's no idea about what product is going to be. We're going to eventually figure it out, you know, when the time yeah. comes. I know it's not a great pitch for investors, but we do need a lots of money to, you know, for lots of computation and stuff like that. So like, yeah, I mean, like, uh, yes, uh, Sam has obviously got a great, um, like you know, track record and stuff like that, right? But still, like it, it's just so hard to see these things uh, in, in in the future, basically, right? So, hundred yeah. percent, you never know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, in AI, so one question I sort of ask around people, you know, wherever I meet these days is, so how do you think your industry and your job is going to get changed by AI, right? And um, obviously, there's like lots and lots of different stuff happening, you know, like when I talk to my lawyer friends, you know, I always talk about this Harvey.ai where, you know, you don't need junior associates anymore. You just, you know, do lots of, you know, it trains on, you know, cases and, and different um, kind of legal frameworks and it just gives you angles of attack in, 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 in a lawsuit and it's super great. So I asked the same question to yourself as well. So now that you've got AI and you saw the potential of what it can do, how do you think it affects sort of the VC firms and the VC model, really? You know, um, is, is that like, do you think that it has zero effect uh, or do you think it has effect? So one thing which I was think thinking about basically is that um, I think one of the investors were talking that it's not going to be lots and lots of big companies, you know, or small, small and big companies that you need have like outlier outcomes, but it's going to be lots of smaller businesses, you know, like agentic businesses that come, come about. This might be one mil ARR, but like, you know, thousand X of them versus your, you know, like hundred mil ARR, you know, and, and, and yeah. So uh, what do you, th have you guys thought about how it's going to change the VC model and how it's going to change your, um, uh, yeah, industry? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's so funny that we're talking about this like two yeah. hours ago, there's oh, this VC right. WhatsApp group, um, okay. for VCs in London and there was yeah. this one, one guy who posted that old friend of mine is building something very similar to this. I see. Um, and then I literally post because it's a VC group. I literally post this question because I have seen like eight companies in the space. Probably. I see. I see. Um, and we have made investment in one. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think like I was asking everyone and all the VCs chimed in. I was like, what do you guys think of this model? Right. Like yeah. what do you expect to be sort of changing? And everyone has their own opinions. It's mm -hmm. so unique, like of mm -hmm. a set of VCs in the same macroeconomic environment, probably looking mm -hmm. at similar or same companies has mm -hmm. different perspectives on what yeah. AI could do with their jobs. I think internally we are, I think, fortunate enough that all of us kind of are aligned on the same page of the kind of impact this would have. Yeah. We don't think that as a venture model it could be replaced because we do a bunch of I things see. we scout we pick we have to pick through due diligence we have to win those deals we have to work with those companies and then you have mm -hmm. to scale them up further and make them ready for like like you know get them to graduate school basically yeah. right yeah, so yeah. It's like we are we are running a school here mm -hmm. um so from that lens, I think internally we are on the page where um, we do think due diligence, a large part of due diligence can be yeah. automated, but the deploying aspect of the fund, which is like you invest in a business after building that level of conviction through diligence yeah. Yeah. cannot be automated. And it's not a factor of, hey, there are no financial tools that yeah. allow for that to happen. There are. But yeah. what you actually need is like that human touch. It's like that human in the loop. Yeah sort of visibility because I personally feel and I love to use this analogy that mm. when I'm evaluating founders, it's basically I'm, you know, I'm their therapist.
Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's session number one. I'm getting to know them. Session yeah. number two, I'm getting to know them even deeper. Session number mm-hmm. three, I'm finally starting to understand them. And mm-hmm. then, you know, I get to a point where I start helping them, which is after the investment happens. Right. Mm-hmm. So as a therapist, I have to psychoanalyze them as well, mm-hmm. which I don't think we are capable of kind of building it out yet, at mm. least until unless, of course, AGI comes in, consciousness mm. is developed. And at that point, maybe a computer can do it better than we can. Mm. But so far, I don't think that empathy yeah. is something that can be replaced and that yeah. EQ that is needed to actually understand a founder or a team better yeah. before investing is exceptionally important. So, you know, it's, you- um, it's interesting you mentioned that. So I came across this product the other day. I forgot what's it called now, but it, it, it focuses on emotional intelligence AI. So it, depending on how you speak, it's going to reply back and answer the question. Like you know, if you, if you're angry, it's going to be softer. You know, if you're, you know, quite happy, it's going to be happy as well. So it like literally it's trained to understand emotions, you know, and then reply to you and then yeah. stuff like that. So uh, just the therapist thing ca- ca- yeah. came to my mind, but that's well, quite I, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. I think where we are today yeah. with AI, it's, yeah. it's like a, it's text based. 90% of LLMs sure. are being used for text based. Only 10% yeah. is recent. Mm. within the reasoning there's more logic than eq mm. um, the reason is because i don't think where we are today the tech is capable of reading subtext yeah and read Fair. text we are not there to read subtext yet so i think diligence can be automated it can be easier it would save us a lot of time it's mm. like more productive honestly it's like going to boost productivity in the vc ecosystem um that's why we've created our own actually internal crm so we don't use mm. any of the traditional crms anymore we have created our own which is completely ai powered right. um, we've been building it for now nearly two years Mm-hmm. Um, and now, yeah, it's pretty much ready and we've been using it for like five months at this point. And okay. yeah, it's very useful. It's it's kind of doing a lot of the work for us and it's very okay. easy to kind of now um, sort of live life. Okay. So like last five months have been very productive. Okay, so you fundamentally think there is no threat to the 220 VC model going in yeah. the next 30 years? Yeah, not in the next 10 years. 30 years okay. is difficult to predict. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. technology. I sure. mean, tomorrow, honestly, like, I don't think AGI is coming in the next couple of years anyway, but like, yeah. and when it comes, I think the VC model would still exist. It would just look different. Hmm. Um, so whether it's 220, 80, whether it's, I don't know, 110, yeah. 90, God knows, right? At this point. Yeah. Right? But yeah. like, all I know is that currently it looks pretty sort of sacrosanct. And I can say that about a large number of professions. I don't think, Mm. like, can you name a single profession that's been, you know, sort of eliminated or, you know, like um, completely taken over by AI, even though we've been here for 18 months? The answer is no. Mm. Um, Can I name a single portfolio company in any sector? We invest in legal tech, prop tech, you know, B2B, supply chain, manufacturing, everything under the sun. Can Mm. I name a single company which says, oh, I don't need to hire a person for that. I can use AI. The answer mm-hmm. is no, nobody has said that. Everyone's like, let me use AI to make my teams more productive instead of replacing mm-hmm. them. So I think mm-hmm. that replacement aspect, we are still far from. Yeah, 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 I, I guess. And, and that last 10%, 5% of, you know, just getting better than humans or equivalent to humans is where the hardest part is, right? Exactly. Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, we, we shall see what goes. Um, there is one other sort of topic I want to touch, uh, basically, which is your big fascination, which is blockchain, right? Uh, we didn't even talk about it yet. Um, so my, um, my kind of, I'm trying to understand here that I know that crypto and blockchain was quite big. We had a big cycle, you know, with the zerp cycle as well and then everything fell flat on their faces you know everything seems quite calm now there seems to be a bit more kind of market activity going on i'm not talking about innovation activity i know builders build even in the winter right um but uh, yeah so what's your what's your thesis on where crypto and blockchain is right now and uh, yeah i mean like what's your thoughts basically the market conditions yeah, I think uh, there's a there's a lot to say here. So I think yeah. the markets, I mean, Bitcoin has historically been definitely linked to like interest rate and dollar yeah. performance. Yeah. But I think we have seen enough times where um, sort of the cycles have flipped. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. for me to actually now think that there's actually no indicator anymore for BTC price. I think the way I think about, I think because Bitcoin is so big enough, it's its own commodity at this point, which mm-hmm. is not necessarily massively swayed by other macroeconomic indicators, which is true for like oil. It's true for like um, mm-hmm. real estate, so on and so forth, right? Because they have become mm-hmm. big enough. Um, so I think from my perspective, there's a lot happening in both the spaces, which is one is cryptocurrencies and then two yeah. is blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, from a crypt- cryptocurrency perspective, bull and bear uh, sort of markets come every 24 months, roughly. Mm-hmm. That's something I've seen for the last seven years at this point. I don't think for that's sure. changing anytime soon. Right. Um, in respect of macro conditions, markets do recover. Um, okay. People just lose conviction every bear market. There are enough voices saying, oh, crypto is dead. Yeah. Um, I have seen four bear markets now, so I think I'm yeah. pretty confident when I say that I don't think crypto is ever going to die now. And because are we entering into a new bull now or where are we basically? So, yeah, I basically don't generally give financial advice. I have to wait. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. <laughs> but um, yeah, I do think that we are at the edge of the bull market starting. I think it started about a couple of months ago. Um, and there were a lot of factors that went into it. I recently did like an internal piece on why there's like Bitcoin coming up and like in feeding into blockchain and now companies being built on top of Bitcoin and runes and ordinals, etc. cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of stuff there. There's, you know, interest rate performance as well. Like ZERP obviously is no longer yeah. there. But there's interest rate performance as well. But at the same time, there is enough um, kind of demand for um, sort of people to diversify their assets. Mm-hmm. Um, there's retail interest, there's institutional interest because it is seen as like, you know, in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin is seen as a safe haven. 51% of all cryptocurrencies are in Bitcoin, mm-hmm. um, like traded globally as well as yeah. held globally, which kind of makes BTC price an indicator for the rest of the market. And if Bitcoin moves, all the other cryptocurrencies move as well. So yeah, yeah I think it just kind of is like one of those things things where I do feel there was a dead cat bounce back in like Mm -hmm. September, October last year, but Mm -hmm. we have been on the recovery for the last quarter now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't see us going back to the way we were in like Jan 23, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't think we are going to go back to that level because I think like July 23 was probably like the peak, July, August probably was like the peak of the, of the bear Mm -hmm. market. Um, I think from like a blockchain perspective, however, I'm very Mm -hmm. bullish. I'm very excited about the potential technologies Mm -hmm. that can be built out because I think Mm -hmm. people just conflate the two and they're like, oh, blockchain has been around for like 15 years. Why haven't you Mm -hmm. guys have your, had your chat GPT moment? This is a question that every single person honestly asks me. And my very basic question is chat GPT is based on 20 plus years of data analytics, ML and AI research. The, the white paper Satoshi Nakamoto dropped like what, less than 15? 16 years ago yeah, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. exactly so um yeah we've basically not reached a point where we have enough technology built out at an infrastructure level for mm-hmm. bitcoin to actually like sorry blockchain to actually be um sort of massively mainstream mm-hmm. so there are plenty of you know things i can take as an example right if you think about cross-border payments for example um transferwise is a portfolio company we love and support the company it's public listed we have been holders for a very very long time still mm-hmm. um even even though they exist, I still believe fundamentally that blockchain can solve for cross-border better because by yeah. design, there's no middle person. There's no transaction fees as such. Like there's nobody who's taking a cut or a commission. Yeah. So theoretically, they should be. But the reason why they can't is because on-ramping and off-ramping mm. on either side is extremely yeah. expensive, yeah. which is the reason why blockchain has not scaled. So now if there's a technology that can help me make that cheaper or negligible or free for that matter, suddenly mm. the transactions become cheaper than you know swift or peer-to-peer or whatever like you know the transfer wise model yeah so that is something that we haven't yet seen so like very Mm. basic fundamental technologies in my opinion are not yet built um and once they are built we'll see a lot of innovation i guess um we have seen a lot of innovation in layer two on ethereum right um i was just checking you know like you know base and 
uh, optimism and, and others, you know, like blast as well. And how like the, the it, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, you're shaking your head for those of who are not watching this, but it, it feels like the transaction fees have gone down, right? And it's, yeah. it's much faster as well. Um, what's your like thinking in terms of layer two and the amount of activity we're seeing there basically? Yeah. So um, I am personally very bullish on base. Um, okay. A lot of it has to do with the distribution mode that they have through the Coinbase user network. Yeah. Um, and Base timed it perfectly because they were able to kind of figure out the nitty gritties um, in the bear market, which is perfect. Yeah. Um, and now they are seeing that kind of adoption and scale that they deserve to see. Mm -hmm. So um, I think across layer twos, there are a bunch. I mean, like OP stack is used by Base. Base doesn't yeah, have correct. no sort of tokens. Yeah. So the token yeah. that they use is actually Optimism, which is um, mm -hmm. sort of a separate um, sort of network mm -hmm. altogether. A um, bunch of layer twos, there are a bunch of alt layer ones as well, apart from Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Across all of these different infrastructures, I think some of the, everyone has their own ecosystems, right? Everyone has users, mm -hmm. they are going after the same set of users. Every single company, like a mainstream company is building on multiple chains um, and is able to kind of tap into those multiple pools of mm -hmm. uh, like users still yet, I mean, two weeks ago, Monad got funded, right? Mm -hmm. Which is an alt layer one. Why are we still funding alternate layer ones? That's because the existing layer ones and all the layer twos combined are still not solving for the fundamental use cases that we need for it to go mainstream and get adapted globally. There are lots and lots of innovation that's happened across ZK rollups and ZK VM in general. Mm -hmm. um, that's been extremely exciting for a large number of sort of, you know, tech native um, users and developers as well, because it makes it significantly cheaper and secure to actually run transactions. Mm -hmm. But is it still um, sort of going mainstream? No, because there are still limitations to what can be built on top of those technologies. Mm -hmm. um, we are trying to solve for real problems in the world and yeah. until, unless we have infrastructure that supports the solution for those real problems, those infrastructures can only have their own tokens and get listed and have communities that believe in it and end up kind of creating this token community and economy that ends up increasing the price during a bull market. Um, yeah. But to me, that is like a token price going up cannot be a business model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It needs yeah. to have something more sust substantial. It needs to have value being accrued over a period of time for it to actually mm. make sustainable, for it to enter that real flight. value, not exactly. just hype. Yeah. <laughs> like for example, yeah. the real value I felt, you know, the potential of WorldCoin was very high, for example, right? Before the regulatory and, you know, intervention mm -hmm. came in and all the orbs across the world got banned, et cetera, what they were trying to collect in yeah. terms of iris could have really truly changed identity globally. Mm. So it's stuff like that, which I feel that current technology is not made to solve for. Mm. There are problems that mm. blockchain theoretically can solve for. It's just the tech is not there yet. Okay. That's what I like to remind people. And if there is yeah. you know, any listener to this podcast who actually thinks that the tech is there in what they are building, hit me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool, actually. So are you saying that fundamentally there is no real world use case of blockchain at scale right now? Um, there are, but like all those okay. use cases have already been taken over by basic TCP IP and World Wide Web. I see. Yeah. So it's it's, like, there's no. It does, exactly. Yeah. It yeah, doesn't necessarily make sense. Reinvent the wheel and replace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There are plenty of use cases that are still available. It's possible to kind of do it, but then they are not able to get scale because sometimes the UI UX is shitty because the tech is yeah. not designed strongly enough for the UI UX to be easier yeah. to use. So there are plenty of reasons why the tech is sometimes there, but there are reasons why it's not going mainstream. Yeah. While in cases where it can go mainstream, my opinion is the tech is actually fundamentally not there yet. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the kind of applications I see right now is basically in finance and like, you know, fi DeFi and, and stuff like that. Are you seeing anything interesting in like enterprise blockchain, basically like for B2B or like, yeah, just outside of outside of that, anything yeah, interesting? Yeah, there's, there's actually a lot. So like there's DeFi. Yeah. DeFi makes a lot of noise in general yeah. because, um, yeah, because they end up having tokens. There's easy yield farming that's done. There's staking and restaking and yeah. liquid restaking, et cetera, that is possible, which makes people make money. And that's why people start talking about it and trying it out. Yeah. So those are a whole different, like d native DeFi, DeFi protocols are a great way of attracting users and get them to understand the basics of 
wallets, mm-hmm. how to sign in, mm-hmm. you know, like how to kind of approve a transaction. Like you have to sign and authenticate for a transaction, like basic stuff. It's a great mm-hmm. kind of top of funnel. Mm-hmm. But is that the end use case? I actually don't think so. I think there's a lot, but a lot of potential here where if you think about it back in the day, like central banks were created and they opened up smaller banks and they were like, okay, you deal with the people and we'll deal with you. Right. Like that mm-hmm. is literally how banking was born. Mm-hmm. Um, genuinely by like just kind of creating like these middlemen and middle structures mm. um defi theoretically has the potential to eliminate all of that right mm. you yeah. bring in like sort of a layer of authenticity because code is law so you can trust what is there on blockchain and you can scale that up further as opposed to calling up somebody and saying hey my bank transfer has not gone through right mm. you basically see it's gone through so the person on the other end is lying if they are saying they didn't get their money Yeah. So it's basic stuff that you know blockchain has the power to do um i do believe that there's a lot happening like there's this one company open trade um that i've known for like now a little over 2 years at this point they are doing mm-hmm. something in like trade and supply chain there are lots of others that are doing b2b i think what you've not seen is b2b saas like b2b mm-hmm. enterprise software has not been tapped yeah. into by blockchain because blockchain by design i don't think is suitable for that as well because enterprise software companies and enterprise software products are using a whole different tech stack so it's yeah. like basically you're saying that you know like an apple iphone should yeah. basically plug into like an android charger which i mean it's ironic i'm saying that example because like my new iphone actually does that but like imagine like the old iphones they didn't do yeah. that so yeah, yeah. yeah i think it's it's just something that you're not kind of by design creating an environment for yeah Yeah. It, I don't think it it will ever embed, which is a good and a bad thing. The good thing is that this results in the possibility of building the next hundred billion dollar company, which I don't think any sector except for climate tech has the potential to build. Yeah. While the bad thing is that it basically makes smaller wins. You know, like the mm. two five hundred million, one two billion companies that come out of selling like B two B SaaS software to like um, yeah. enterprises. They don't exist in blockchain. Interesting, interesting. So it's, it's interesting you say that. Um, so I think I was listening to Chris Dixon speak about this, and he was talking about how he thinks that there will be hybrid architectures. You know, so most of your stuff you would do computation in general. You know, uh, protocols and stuff, and then a minority of stuff you would need to do. in the blockchain sort of architecture and these are quite sharp use cases for that uh, i wonder if uh, and what you're saying i believe is that that's not going to be the case so you think it's either fully that or what they have right now as in i didn't get the question fully that so uh, as in like uh, there's not going to be no hybrid architecture of whatever I mean, they it's have it's possible yeah. right like distributed yeah. ledger theoretically um yeah. possible for it to have like for example hyperledger was created in 2017 or 18 by microsoft yeah. um and they were trying to kind of embed that in their product stack with office imagine you could have had a distributed ledger app on mm-hmm. your sort of laptop to safeguard all the documents um or like run certain simulations or transactions of sort and yeah. then they end up not doing it because it's hard it's really hard to kind of build something like that which they would think hey why not just use dropbox or something else mm. um that can potentially sort of you know store it on the cloud for that matter like why do you need it to be stored on your local machine that mm. to in a in like a ledger format um so yeah i think it's just it's that's what i'm saying it's possible theoretically mm. it's there are use cases plenty of use cases but mm. we already have um existing is existing adoption and distribution yeah. modes that are so strong for current technologies that it's hard to kind of overtake that if the product is not 10x better and mm. the only way in my opinion to make a product 10x better with that kind of distribution like the kind of distribution microsoft has you mm. have to make it like free and mm. exceptionally high performing right yeah where yeah. i think the tech doesn't exist necessarily yeah so yeah i think that's that's basically the sort of the concern right now i do believe that eventually we will see hybrid models yeah. but um yeah i'm hoping that the tech moves in that direction honestly okay cool cool makes sense um last two questions before i sort of let you go so i mean this cycle we kind of saw again meme coins you know bursting into the scene lots of stuff happening with those 
uh, and uh, we saw last cycle as well i guess we see in every cycle but you know it just keeps on popping it's just easier to generate meme coins so do you think that there is a persistent sort of something persistent nature to these meme coins a phenomena in yeah. the future or do you think it's just like a temporary stuff you know that's i, I think uh, meme yeah. coins are gonna be uh, in this bull market what nfts were in the last bull market Wow. Um I think that's basically what's going to happen and it's not surprising meme coins have been around for so long. Yeah. Like I bought my first meme I won't even mention which one I'm not going to get that. <laughs> but I bought no, my canceled, first don't meme worry. Coin. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> my first meme coin in 2017. So wow. yeah, yeah, right? Like all of us have done that. I've played the game and I've understood what it is. Meme coin yeah. is basically get rich quick schemes. Yeah. Um, it's very exciting. Like the DGen or like Pepe yeah. or like any of the others that are like doing very, very well. Yeah. Um, all of them are basically sort of, um, you know, all about community and hype. Mm. Until unless, of course, they can find a utility product to attach themselves to. And in that mm -hmm. case, they become like an exceptionally sort of, you know, in demand, um, sort of important commodity that everyone yeah. want a part of. Mm. But yeah, I think... Um, yeah, it's it's good to also have that I feel because you should mm. continuously have users that are making decent amounts of money in the space so mm. that they are feeling inspired enough to keep and digging out in a potential yeah. exactly technology yeah. um, and retained in a bear market, which by design doesn't necessarily like in tech, for example, I've seen so many people go from tech to like MBAs and then do banking in the last two years, right? Because um, sort of layoffs were hard and yeah. there's no other way to make money in tech. If stock market goes down, layoffs happen, everything is down. Like how do you make money in tech? Yeah. Nobody wants to pay for anything, but in crypto, you can always kind of do short-term trading. You can do like, mm. you know, even in a bear market, you can make money. So yeah. yeah, I think it's it's a good incentive for people to actually stick around. Now, no, no comments on the quality of of a lot of the users <laughs> that are that are sticking around. But yeah. I think regulation is also helping weed some of it out. I also think regulation by litigation is not helpful. Mm. Um, my also fear is in AI, for example, you touched upon LLMs kind of yeah. being sort of like you know um, custom models being created out of LLMs. Yeah. So, you know, going through the process like RLHF or like RLAIF, yeah. etc. my concern would be eventually RLAIF could be regulated the way blockchain is today. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's by litigation is fearful. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's at this point, just thinking about pessimistic future scenarios is not something a VC does. Anyway. So, so, so you I think that, um, so you think that it's too early to regulate anything in crypto? And, I, yeah. I I do think a lot of regulation needs to exist. I do, yeah. but I also do think at the same time regulators are not regulating the arena; they are regulating the people um, to set examples um, mm -hmm. and to discourage specific use cases instead of just creating like a boundary. You create the boundary and it's wide enough, it's big enough, then you allow people to play in that arena. Even if something doesn't work out, it's fine. It doesn't stifle innovation. What they do is they don't define that boundary. Somebody outside the boundary does something and then they regulate that, like they create a law based on that. And then somebody actually in the arena feels that, oh my God, I can't do this because mm. that happened to that person. Mm. So it's just, it's it's important to remember that these are people building. Yeah. And there's no human being on the planet that doesn't experience fear. Yeah. Right. So it's important to understand that you do not stifle innovation with the guise of fear. You mm. stifle innovation. Uh, so you basically create an arena where you can regulate the right kind of sort of innovation and discourage the bad actors. So I don't yeah. think that's happening anywhere in the world right now. Mm, that's interesting. That's interesting. So we'll see how things go in Europe, which seems to be quite, you know, definitely in the right direction for regulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but in so, the right direction, honestly, like yeah. way better than uh, most of Asia and the US. Wow, interesting, interesting, interesting. You think that? Um, cool, makes sense. I, I had one last sort of um, kind of question to ask, which is: um, so we talked about AI, plenty of energy happening. And we talked about blockchain and crypto also seems like plenty of energy there and a lot of building going on. Is there anything in the nexus and intersection between those two that you're seeing right now where, you know, use cases or development or building going on, which is like AI and crypto together? Oh, there's or, so yeah. much. Oh, my God. Where do I even start? Um, I think <laughs> one of my favorite is decentralized compute. 
Um, so like compute H one hundred chips are so expensive. So okay. decentralized compute basically taps into the underutilized existing chips and hardware okay. for supporting GPU and processing globally, um, okay. and that is supported by let's say token economy for incentivizing the owners of that hardware to mm. actually firm up the sec- the way the security token exists in like infrastructure of blockchain. This exists for like sort of rewarding the sort of hardware. Um, owners. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a very, very interesting space. Then there's other sort of white spaces where content creators, they created content, they uploaded on certain websites, um, different kinds of LLMs have tapped into that content that's publicly available and used it to train their LLMs without rewarding mm-hmm. or sharing any kind of revenue sharing model with the content creators. Mm-hmm. So yeah, again, a token economy could help here. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you couldn't like any kind of incentive structure or anything that is basically being built out from um, fundamental crypto or uh, sorry, fundamental AI or fundamental LLMs has so much potential to actually interact with crypto. It's baffling. So there are like probably mm-hmm. 20 use cases. I yeah. also did a I also did a post on this, I believe I'll, I'll send that link across. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. I'll put it in the show notes. That's quite interesting, really. Uh, brilliant. Um, with that positive note of lots of brewing innovation in all fields, um, th- Ash Ura, thanks a lot for joining us today. And uh, I'll let you go. I know we went over a little, but I hope you, you had a bit of fun. Yeah. It was lovely. Thank you so much, Vahid, for having me. I appreciate it. Brilliant, brilliant.